Welcome to the Weekly Lead. I'm Pastor Becky Tirabasi, and every week I want to encourage you to be a leader in your sphere of influence. Will you join me for this week's message? If you recall a few weeks ago, I asked, are you a gospel patron? And I titled the podcast part one. I told the story of how John Reinhardt, the author, wrote about three times in world history over the last 500 years when a very influential business owner or wealthy leader in a, in a nation helped either a pastor or a missionary or a Bible translator or a revivalist uh, go beyond his own ability to reach a nation with the gospel, with the Bible, because of their generous giving. And I asked, are you a gospel patron? And it was, you know, the question that would open your heart and mind to becoming a part of something like that. Well, I have become the recipient of the work of gospel patrons as a pastor here in California who has a prayer house in Washington, D.C., just a few blocks from the Capitol. And the only reason I can do this is because gospel patrons from across the United States came to a little gathering in September of 2019 and offered to help me uh, rent a beautiful little house right near the Capitol and invite people to come and pray once a week for our nation, and specifically for revival in our nation. So you can see how important uh, a gospel patron has become to me, and I told this story, if you want to uh, go back to the podcast that's titled, Are You a Gospel Patron? Part 1. Because in essence, part 2 is what's happened since those gospel patrons uh, were helpful in uh, allowing me to travel regularly to Washington, D.C., and have a house um, that's open for leaders in our nation to come and pray. And I've done this now. It'll be four years in September. And one of the things that I have regularly done while in D.C. at the Lead House, and it's called the Lead House. Of course, that stands for L, loyalty to God's word. Everyone gets a Change Your Life Daily Bible, and hundreds of people in Washington, D.C. Um, have the Change Your Life Daily Bible, and as is the opportunity for anyone, you can open it or you can uh, look at it on a shelf. Many, many, many have opened it daily and read through the Bible together, which I think is a recipe for revival. The E in lead is encouragement to each other. And you know, it's so easy to be discouraged in a place where there's so much division and, or where you feel you are um, not making a difference because your attempts um, to help or to pray or to move the ball down the field don't seem to be going very far. So encouragement, the encouraging words to each other um, is so important to keep your spirit moving on a a long road or journey, which is what so many of the gospel patrons and their stories achieved. They were over and over encouragement to each other when fatigue or lack of money or lack of um, uh, opportunity just had fallen on them like a, a stone in the path. The gospel patrons would come along and help move the big block, because they were generous and able to do so. The A is for advocacy for the young generation. And you see, advocacy for the young generation is so important. Every generation, every decade, every year, and you can see in the 21st century, in the year in which I'm sharing today's podcast, the young generation... uh, highest numbers of anxiety, depression in the military, highest numbers of suicide attempts. You know, there's just so much um, 
emotional, uh, and I would say uh, lack of spiritual hope in our young generation without adults and strong believers really making an effort to be an advocate for the young generation in your sphere of influence. And then D is for devotion to prayer. And if you have been a part of this podcast for now it's been a year and a half, I consistently ask, would you just start a prayer meeting in your sphere of influence? That's all I did in Washington, D.C. The minute I was given an opportunity by having a house a couple of blocks from the Capitol, I started a 7 a.m. Wednesday morning prayer meeting, and we've grown and grown and grown. It started only with three people, though. And over the four years or three and a half years now, almost four, we're very close, the room is full. And that is part of what um, I believe every single one of us is to do. We're supposed to lead in our sphere of influence, be loyal to God's word, give that Bible away, read it alongside of the young people, your coworkers, your family members, um, everyone that even strangers, uh, be encouragers and advocates to the young generation. And of course, devoted to prayer. Well, in the Gospel Patron, one of the seminal stories is of John Thornton, the generous, wealthy uh, businessman in England at the time, found uh, a place for John Newton. Now, you know that name because he was the author of hundreds of hymns, and one of which was Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound That Saved a Wretch Like Me, I Once Was Lost, But Now I'm Found, Was Blind, But Now I See. That John Newton was given a place to live and money to live on (laughs) as a little pastor set down in the middle of parliament in England, and for a season, decade or more, he began to minister to the parliamentarians who would pray together, read the Bible together, and eventually became the group of people. They gave themselves a little nickname because it was the location in which they lived near the parla- near parliament. It, they called themselves the Clapham Circle. And one of the leaders of that little group was the parliamentarian named William Wilberforce. So this three, this trio, John Thornton, John Newton, and William Wilberforce were fundamental to abolishing slavery in England. It wasn't overnight. It took time. It took money. It took a lot of prayer. It took holding on to the word of God so faithfully in a culture that was so um, divided over slavery. Truly, church people were on both sides of that. Um, issue, uh, just as they were in America, but England got to it quicker. And perhaps it was because that gospel patron uh, put that amazing grace pastor in the middle of parliament. And William Wilberforce began to chip away at those who resisted abolishing slavery until um, It was completed 20 years, at least, after they began. I thought I'd just share before, uh, in in that it's uh, the halfway mark in the Bible. We're getting into the book of Romans. If you're following in the Change Your Life Daily Bible, it's kind of that freedom month in July. William Wilberforce wrote a book before the abolition of slavery, before um, the turn of the century. So in 1797, he wrote a book called Real Christianity. And, And publishers, friends, asked him not to do it. They said, oh, this is going to be controversial. This is going to 
make people not like you as much. Maybe you won't be <laughs> elected again, right? But William Wilberforce, nonetheless, and I believe it is because he lived in a circle of friends, like-minded, with the help of a, a tremendous spiritual leader and a wonderful, generous business person who would afford, who would allow the pastor to live near the parliamentarians and the parliamentarians not to fatigue in their fight against slavery. I have taken this book, Real Christianity, and taught it maybe five times now. Once in Newport Beach, where I live as a pastor, I taught it to the women in our community. And then in Washington, D.C., I've shared the outline that I found in the book, Genuine, or Real Christianity, um, The Eight Traits of Genuine Faith from this book that William Wilberforce wrote about, taught about, believed young and old should live with these traits to prove that their faith is without a doubt the thing that drives them to live above the culture and break through the strongholds. And I just thought today, um, as Are You a Gospel Patron Part 2, I would just share what those eight traits of genuine faith are. They came from this, this catalyst group who abolished slavery. And they were a small group. They were not um, a massive group. They were people who, as I've mentioned, prayed together, read the Bible together, and were adamant that the Bible would be their um, template, their um, guidebook, their strength. And it's one of the reasons that I uh, encourage everyone, read through the entire Bible in a year. You learn so much in the Old Testament about <laughs> what not to do as a follower of God. You see leaders who are just downright bad leaders, and it's not hard to define who they are when you read about them in the Bible. In the New Testament, you know, you, you see the, the work of Jesus Christ, the message of Jesus Christ, and then after you've read the four Gospels and the book of Acts, you begin to go through the letters of Paul, beginning in Romans, where you see the theology that came from uh, the Gospels and to put it into a, a community's hands. Here's how you live out um, the Gospel of Jesus Christ. So uh, we're, we're right in this place where we could start to make that huge and massive and wonderful difference um, as gospel patrons and those who are um, given the opportunity by the patron to make a difference in our sphere of influence. And that should be every one of us, you and me. We all have the Bible. We all have the ability to invite people to come into our home or our workplace and pray once a week, 30 minutes for revival in America. The eight traits of genuine, indubitable, I love to say, impossible to doubt faith in and from Wilberforce's book, Real Christianity, our joy triumphing over difficult situations, you would exhibit joy. The second would be the honorable display of Christian character. Your character as a Christian would be different. Wilberforce put it this way, if you feel that your life does not reflect the reality of Christ in the way it should, do not lose heart God is in the transformation business. Isn't that amazing? You'll really want to get this book, Real Christianity, by William Wilberforce, written in 1797, and there's other many versions now of it since that have been reprinted, um, and in less of the high English and more of um, English that is more 21st century. The third trait of genuine faith is your reputation. You know, Guard it is what William Wilberforce says because genuine faith is on, on display through your reputation. The fourth trait of genuine faith is maturity. You know, spiritual maturity in your relationships makes the gospel a way to validate that what the Bible says is true. 
maturity is kind of that linchpin. It's kind of the thing. You take maturity out of a Christian and you begin to fall apart in terms of forgiveness and patience and all the words that equate with love in 1 Corinthians 13. The fifth trait would be to cleanse your heart and mind daily in what? Humility. You know, whether you're in the Old Testament where it's Second Chronicles, you know, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray. There, there's no first step to revival other than humility in each person's life. And, and we have to go there. It can't be pride. It can't be anger. It can't be self-righteousness or righteous anger. It has to be humility in front of God and others for revival to find a foothold and break through the strongholds. The seventh trait would be endurance. <laughs> and that does make sense, doesn't it? You know, four years almost of praying in the lead house is a long time to grow slow. Yet the difference we're making, the Bibles we're giving away, the encouragement we've been to each other and the advocacy for the young generation that is growing gives us um, courage to keep coming around the table and meeting for prayer. That's seventh trade endurance. Every gospel patron gives uh, the people who are working on the front lines by their generosity. So you can see how everything fits. The gospel patron uh, allows a pastor or a leader to stay in the area of uh, uh, that needs change and bring hope regularly, even when everyone else is fatigued, to keep going, to break through the strongholds. And then finally, prayer must be non-negotiable. And you see it, you will see it in um, the life of a genuine Christian. They are, will be devoted to prayer. We've read Ian Bounds, heard Ian Bounds, uh, one of the uh, 19th, 20th century, early 20th century authors say, much prayer, much power, little prayer, little power. You know the next, say it with me, no prayer, no power. So, are you a gospel patron? Part two was actually, have you identified your sphere of influence? Are you to help the spiritual atmosphere change in an area by your generosity? Are you the spiritual leader who is to come into that area and fan a flame on revival, which is simply a new obedience to God by giving uh, Bibles away um, in instilling endurance into uh, the leaders in an area who are fighting a battle? And finally, are you the leader? Are you the person who is the spokesperson for God in a certain area to speak out in truth for the gospel, which is the good news that Jesus Christ came to earth was crucified, died, buried, and rose again from the dead. And he lives today. Which person are you? You're one of the three, the gospel patron who might be quiet and shy, quiet and shy but have much to give. Are you the spiritual leader who is to be consistent in your encouragement spiritually to help others grow in maturity and endure until God brings change to an area? Or are you the one on the, on the front lines doing the work? May God bless you, encourage you, and fill you with his Holy Spirit today. Amen? Amen. I hope you've been encouraged by this message, and I hope you join me weekly for the Weekly Lead Podcast. Meanwhile, follow me daily on Instagram, the link is in the bio with everything you need to become a weekly leader.